Uh, thanks for everyone who's stuck around to the very end of the boot camp. Um, we have Jonathan Leake coming from TU Berlin to tell us uh, about the second part of optimization and sampling under Symmetry. Yeah, so thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming to this very last talk of the week. Um, and yeah, I'm gonna continue on what Nishid was talking about last talk and try to give you a sense of the lead theoretic underpinnings of what was going on, um, what, he was, what he was talking about. Uh, and as, uh, as Nishith pointed out, we have these notes that kind of go into a lot more detail about both of our talks on the archive if you want to check those out. Okay, so let me start off by kind of discussing Nishith's, excuse me, talk a little bit. So he had one optimization problem and one sampling problem. Okay, so we had some permission n by n matrix. The eigenvalues were given by a vector y, and we considered these two kind of situations. Okay, so let me, let me look at the sampling one first because it has some of the definitions here. So we were sampling from the complex unit sphere according to this density, okay, from some V on the unit sphere, or there was some equivalent way to state this where we were sampling from, from unitary matrices. So I'm going to use this UN to denote the set of all unitary matrices. Uh, we sampled from this, or also he used this kind of script P1 to denote all the rank one projections, which is just exactly what this kind of orbit of the unitary group cuts out. So that's why you can just replace this, with this P here. So that was one problem we considered. The other one was this uh, minimum eigenvalue problem where we kind of take these expressions in the exponents and just minimize over them. Okay, and as I think Cole mentioned in the previous talk, this is sort of like, there's a way to view this as some kind of limiting of, of this over here where you put some temperature and limit it to infinity, I think. Okay, but the point is, right, these, these have like kind of a, a very symmetric, right? There's a very symmetric story here. Uh, and that becomes even more clear when you look at some theorems associated with how uh, these things are proven or, or kind of what's going on with these things. So uh, Nishith actually looked at, at the, the diagonal map applied to the orbit of Y, but I'm actually going to look at the diagonal map of the orbit applied to the set of all rank one projections here. That's going to be the standard simplex. And over here, we had a very similar thing where we wanted to look at this integral. Somehow we wanted to compute this and it ended up being some integral, some very similar integral over the standard simplex. In fact, there was some, you know, some formula for this. Um, but the point is there, there's kind of a lot of similar things going on here. And we want to know what is the underlying structure that unites these problems and kind of makes everything work. Okay. So the answer, generally speaking, is symmetry. And what that's going to mean for us in this talk, generally speaking, is it's going to be the action of some group on the elements of some manifold. I'm going to use green for group, whenever group things are happening, and magenta for manifold, whenever ma manifold things are happening. So if you see those colors, that's kind of what's what the point of that is. Okay, and so the idea is, right, we have some group element G and some X in, in our manifold, and we're gonna act on it, we're gonna use this notation where G dot X just means that G acts on X. And so that's gonna be some function like this that maps to some other point in our manifold. Like when we conjugate by unitary matrices, we, uh, from, you know, we conjugate some diagonal matrix, with unitaries, we get some other permission matrix that has the same eigenvalues. Okay, and some examples of this, uh, which Nishith kind of talked about, are we have maybe the, the some discrete examples where the symmetric group acts on the entries of some vector. Uh, we have, if we have some convex body, we can shift it within Rn uh, by, by adding some vector to all the points. Um, we can also rotate these bodies. And then as we saw on the previous slide, maybe the unitary group acts on the complex unit sphere by multiplication like this. And the point of this, or, or generally speaking, what symmetry does is, is it sort of mods out coincidental or duplicate information. Coincidental being something like, let's say I care about you know, the volume of something like this or the surface area. Okay, it doesn't really matter how I embed it into RN. It doesn't matter if I shift it around or rotate it. Those things are sort of, those, the coordinate, the way it's sort of put into RN is coincidental. The, the information I care about is the, uh, is sort of what's left over. Same with the eigenvalues, right? We have all these permission matrices with the same eigenvalues by conjugation. What's left over when I remove the symmetry is uh, it's just the eigenvalues. So an another thing maybe to, to, you know, another way to look at this, and this is sort of the duplicate part here, and this is gonna be some really maybe simple version of, of something like the HCIZ formula. Um, but let's suppose we, we looked at the hypercube. Okay, and this is not gonna be like the HCIZ formula at all, but maybe it'll give something, you know, some spirit of it. Um, and let's suppose we wanted to compute some partition function on it. Okay, we have some function f, and if I, you know, if I want to sum up all the values on the on the vertices of the hypercube, I really have to go and you know compute each each one of them and add them all up, right? And there are two to the n of those. 
But if this function was symmetric, then what I could do is I could sort of group these vertices, right, based on how many ones and how many zeros they have, okay? And all the, all, for the function f, all these green vertices would have the same value, all these orange vertices would have the same value, and the difference here is between two to the n evaluations, if I don't know this symmetry, or n plus one. Okay, so this is a very simple example, but maybe illustrates why you might expect something like the HCIZ formula to work, uh, because you have some integrals, some kind of like really big sum, boiling down to some small sum. Okay, and so then the question now that we're going to try to answer is, how does this sort of thing, duplicate information, these symmetries, how you can reduce things, how, how does this kind of really relate to the two problems above? Okay, so let's, let's go for it. So here's going to be the outline. So the, the lead theory part of this is going to be mainly focused around doing some computations for the unitary group. I'm going to assume very little lead theory, and so I'm going to try to pretty economically talk about some of the, some of the lead theoretic concepts that we need. I'll try to generalize it a little bit uh, beyond the unitary group. And then we'll return to our two problems uh, and then I'll conclude. And the one comment I wanna make here about starting with the unitary group is this sort of means that we're, we're kind of going away. The stuff that Avi and, and, and Michael talked about in the morning were much more related to groups like GLN, these complex uh, Lie groups. And the groups that we're gonna be focusing on are gonna be compact Lie groups, which are sort of in a different category. And in fact, if you remember from Michael's talk, um, often the unitary group was sort, of, was sort of removed. They were looking at some norm minimization problem and the unitary group preserves the norm. So it was sort of forgotten. And what was left over was these positive definite matrices. So we're gonna be doing something pretty different than that. We're gonna be focusing on the unitary group and these compact groups. Okay. So what is it? It's the set of all n by n complex matrices with this relation, u u star is the identity, okay? It's a group, as Nishit talked about, and it also inherits a manifold structure from the fact that it lies in the space of n by n matrices. Okay. And so on the group side, we get a lot of things like this, operations, an identity element, maybe some homomorphisms. On the manifold side, we can do calculus. There are paths, smooth mappings between things. Okay, and we've got some kind of like subgroups related. Uh, so like we saw kind of in earlier talks, if you look at the set of all invertible complex matrices, this is some subgroup of that and it's compact. And also this happens to have some abelian subgroup, which is the set of all diagonal matrices, which look like this. So diagonal matrices with, with compact torus elements, the diagonals. And, but the most important kind of feature of the unitary group that we're gonna focus on is the fact that this group and manifold structure are compatible. So right, if you, what that means is if you look at this multiplication map and you look at your inversion map, these are actually smooth maps. So these are, you know, a priori, these are group operations, but because we have this manifold structure and because it's, it's compatible, this is something you have to prove, but it's, you know, this is a well-known fact at this point. Uh, these are actually smooth maps in the sense of the manifold structure. So the question then is now, what can we get from this compatibility? Okay. Okay. So, right, we have this group structure. We have this manifold structure on UN. And so let's start kind of just playing around and see what we can what we can do to combine them. So the first thing is, right, we know that this unitary group is a manifold. So what, what can we do? Well, we know it has tangent spaces at every point. And we can compute, you know, elements of the tangent space by, by looking at paths in the group and taking derivatives. This is the standard way to compute tangent space elements. Okay, but it's also a group. And so we have this distinguished tangent space of the identity matrix. So we're going to sort of focus in on this one element of the group and look at the tangent space there. Okay, and let's, so again, I'm just trying to feel out here, trying to pretend that I don't know what's about to happen. Okay, so let's suppose I wanna start computing this tangent space. Okay, so I'm gonna look at any path, little short path in UN, that's this F of T here that passes through the identity at T equals zero. And I'm gonna take the derivative to get this X in the tangent space. Okay, I'm gonna use either this or this notation. So this is the kind of standard notations for computing these tangent vectors. Okay, and so, you know, I, I can do this, right? I, I, can, I can write down this, I have some path, I take the derivative, I get some tangent space element. You know, all tangent space elements arise in this way, but I've only sort of used the manifold structure. Okay, so what else can I do? Well, I can use the fact that we have this group kind of rule, right? This is the thing that defines the unitary group. Okay, and so using this fact, the fact that we have this group multiplication and this identity here, we can actually say a lot more about the tangent space. In particular, if you look at this expression, 
right? What I'm going to do is instead of just taking derivative of f, I'm going to look at the kind of this, the path multiplied its, by itself conjugated at the same t variable. And since we know that for any t, this is a unitary group element, I know that this expression is always identity. So if I take derivative, I'm going to get zero. And now I can just apply the, the product rule to this, right? So I take derivative of this one, plug in zero, and then plug in zero here. And then on, you know, for this one, I take the derivative over here. This is just the Leibniz rule. And the point is, right, I know at, at, at zero, this and this are both identity. And what that leaves is f prime of zero plus f prime of zero star. And I've used x to denote that. And so I get this expression. And what this says to us is that this kind of gives us, right, this, this group rule that we had for unitaries sort of descends down, or I guess up, or whatever you want to call it, to the tangent space of the identity. Right, this tangent space is now the set of all skew Hermitian matrices because I have this relation, right? Every tangent space element arises from some derivative of a path. We can play this game for any one of those, and we get this identity that the conjugate transpose of x is equal to minus x. Okay, and the point is here, right, this is some group info was translated into extra info in the tangent space. And if you've, if you've seen this before, I mean, like, I don't know, maybe all of you have, I'm not really sure. Um, this is like, this is a very nice thing. This is kind of one of the nice things about, about lead groups in their, in their tangent spaces. You get some really nice description of this tangent space at the identity. And so now, right, what do we have? We have this tangent space, which now we have a really nice representation for, or at least some really nice description of it, okay? And we have this, right, these are matrices. Our group is matrices. So maybe we can act upon our, our tangent space with, these, with, these, with this group of matrices. So let's see what we can do with that. Okay, so this is what we saw last slide. Okay, and because we have matrices, what we can do now is we can act on this tangent space via conjugation. Okay, conjugation is a, is a group operation, just multiplication. And the reason why this is a reasonable action is because, okay, here's my X from the tangent space that I'm conjugating by U. I'm looking at the conjugate transpose and I sort of you know, do a very basic computation. And I see that this ends up just being negative of the sort of conjugated X that I started with. So in fact, this operation preserves the tangent space. It's still skew permission after I do this. Okay, so this is like a valid action. It, it takes one element of the tangent space and sends it to another. Okay, and, the, and the point here is that you get some symmetries of the tangent space coming from the group via this, this action, which we're now always going to denote by u dot x. And another nice thing about this, which this is you know, kind of where we're going we're gonna to be going here, if you think about um, right, if you think about this conjugation action on this whole vector space, which is the tangent space, um, it partitions this vector space into orbits. I mean, this is always true whenever you have a, a group action like this. Um, but these orbits, right, what are they? Well, this tangent space, it's not quite Hermitian matrices, but it's almost, they're skew Hermitian. And I'll, I'll mention this more, more concretely later, but the, uh, the connection between Hermitian and skew Hermitian is just multiplication by I. So this is, this is, you know, for all intents and purposes, this is essentially Hermitian matrices. And so the point is now these unitary conjugation orbits of these matrices, um, you know, they, they sort of partition this, this tangent space into sets of matrices with the same eigenvalues, right? So this is gonna be the analogous thing to say P1, which is the set of all matrices with one, pot, one eigenvalue one, the rest zero, or looking at these unitary orbits of other Hermitian matrices. This is gonna be sort of what, what is gonna generalize here. But we will get to that. Um, okay. So we, we had this, we have this group, we have this nice tangent space. The group acts very naturally on this tangent space. Okay, what about the skew Hermitian matrices themselves? They're matrices, maybe they can sort of act on themselves or something like this. And uh, the problem here is these aren't a group, so you can't maybe get some action exactly, but you can do something, which is kind of interesting, which is basically given by this matrix commutator here, okay? And the point of this line here is just to show that this actually preserves skew Hermitian matrices. Okay, and so this, this is a little bit, you know, out of thin air. I'm just kind of pulling this out of nowhere. If you know where I'm going, I mean, you know where this is, where this is coming from. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that, 
and before I guess before I say that, the point I'm trying to make here is that there, there seem to be these kind of really nice actions that you can do coming from the group or the, or the tangent space on, on the tangent space that preserve it. That kind of like, you know, either the group, it's a very nice group action, or this thing maybe has some nice properties, maybe we'll get to see. And in fact, one way to even view this, if you, if you kind of squint at this for just a little bit, right, and you think of you, um, right, instead of putting you and you inverse here, you maybe put a path through unitaries and, and the inverse, you could kind of see how this becomes sort of like a product rule on this, right? Where maybe on, you know, for the, I first take derivative of this, and then I take derivative of this. When I take this derivative, this Y shows up. And when I take this derivative, maybe this minus one comes down and the Y is over here. Okay, so this actually is quite related to this group action. And we'll see that a little more formally later. Okay, but again, like continuing this, this theme, what's happening on this, on this unitary group is we have these two structures and they continue to combine to give these symmetries. The point is we have this, we have this group. Is that a question? Oh, okay. We have, this, uh, we have this group, we have this manifold structure and putting them together it leads us to you know, actions on this tangent space. It gives us this kind of partitioning of the tangent space into orbits based on eigenvalues. These are exactly the sort of things that Nishith was looking at in the previous talk. Um, and so as we start to, the, the point I'm trying to, I'm trying to make you feel that these, that, that kind of, there's a lot here and that, you know, maybe you'll start to feel that this sort of has to generalize, right? I'm, I'm kind of pulling things out of the air, but it seems very nice. It seems very kind of structural. Um, and so let's see, let's see what else we can get here. Okay. And so the last thing before I move on to talking exactly about why all of these things arise uh, so nicely, what, like where the, where the act, where this structure actually comes from. Uh, let me talk about one more thing, which is this inner product. So throughout these, you know, these two, everything that she was talking about, and in particular in these two, these two problems, there was always this special inner product that was that was around. It was always this Frobenius inner product. And here's how you can how you can define it. Okay. And if you restrict this to skew remission matrices, this is just, I mean, this is a very simple computation, but right, what do we know? We know that y star is minus y, so you get a minus sign out here, and you just get this bilinear form x, y. So minus trace of x, y. And this ends up being some inner product on, uh, on this tangent space. Okay, and so, okay, fine, right? We had this great inner product. What's, what's the point of this? You, you sort of added a minus sign and okay, great. And, and the point I want to make with this is there's some really nice things that we saw in Nishisa's talk, which I will, I will you know, give you here again. So the first point is, right, if you, if you look at this conjugation action of you on each of these elements of the tangent space here, right, that just boils down to just the inner product between these two. So this thing is inter invariant under the unitary group. And even more, this kind of mystical commutator I talked about in the last slide also has a similar property. So if you kind of put a commutator over here, you can sort of switch it to the other side at the cost of a minus sign. Okay, so this is kind of a whirlwind of features of the unitary group. The symmetries that they that, that the unitary group provides on its tangent space, some operations, this inner product that's really nice. So what's really going on? Okay, so this is where Lie theory comes in. And the point is that a Lie group generalizes the unitary group in a, in a very natural way. As we have seen through many of the talks here, basically what it is, is it's a, it's a group and a manifold such that the group operations are smooth. Okay, so this, this phrase I used before that the structures are compatible, it's just, you have these two structures, you put them together, they work nicely together. That's what a Lie group is. Okay, and here are some, some examples of the kind of the matrix Lie groups. So these are ones that arise, you know, these are some subset of matrices. Um, we saw these in the morning talks. This one is the one that I'll be focusing on mainly um, but the stuff that I will be talking about will also apply to uh, these, the unitaries here, uh, these rotation matrices, these unitary symplectics, if you, if you care about those. Um, but there are a number of these things. And there's actually, you know, I mean, you can think of any kind of closed subgroup of any of these matrix groups, and you're always going to get um, some Lie group. And uh, you know, I kind of mentioned before, right? We had these we had these two subgroups that we talked about a little bit, um, and it turns out they're actually Lie subgroups. So all that means is you have this set of invertible complex matrices, um, and you look at U n, 
the manifold structure is kind of inherited from this. It's a subgroup that come, that is a subgroup of this of this general linear group. And the same thing goes for this compact torus here as well. And in fact, all matrix groups actually are just least subgroups of GLN. Okay, so we have this unitary group. Now we're looking at a bunch of groups. So how exactly does what we did with the unitary group kind of convert to a general Lie group? Okay, and, and the point I'm gonna make on this slide is that these ideas that we looked at with the unitary group and the symmetries we saw in the tangent space, they generalize to any group uh, G with, with identity E. But of course, the, the kind of the problem there is, you know, right, all the, all the Lie groups I listed on the previous page are all matrix groups, but the definition was just, you know, a manifold structure and a group structure. A priori, there's not any matrices going on. There's no sense of conjugation. Um, and so we need some way to, to generalize this notion of conjugation. Um, and there is a way to do that. So what we can do is, instead of looking at the conjugation action of G on its tangent space, which a priori doesn't really make sense right now, we can actually look at the action of G on itself via conjugation. So I just fix some element G of the group. And I look at this map, which just sends H to the conjugate of H, right? This is, this is a group. This is just multiplication in the group. So that's, that's fine. We can do this. And we know that it's smooth by the compatibility assumption. And what you can do is now, okay, you, this is some smooth map between Lie groups. So we can do calculus. We can take the differential um, at, the, at the identity. Um, and what that is gonna give us is it's gonna give us some map from the tangent space of the identity to, to itself that basically sort of looks like conjugation, right? It's sort of conjugation of some path with a derivative. So the point here is, and uh, you know, this is called the adjoint action. And, and you heard Nishith use this phrase adjoint orbits uh, last time. And it, it comes from this because even though we don't a priori know that this tangent space is made up of matrices, there is a way to generalize this idea of conjugation and the way that it's, the, the way that it's generalized is like this and it's called the, the adjoint action. Okay, so we have now this conjugation action, um, you know, conjugation in quotes action of G on its tangent space. And I'm not gonna really say this, but the point is, it turns out what, what you, can, you can further do is basically, you know, reinterpret this in some kind of interesting way and further take another derivative and get this kind of algebra adjoint action, which the point of me saying this is just that Right. Okay. So it's very clear to us that this that this thing here, if I were to if I were to look at the unitary group, would end up just being this conjugation. That's what we expect. But then this kind of der taking derivative of this function ends up getting us this this matrix commutator. And so the point here is that even though right matrix commutator doesn't make sense for things that aren't matrices, conjugation doesn't necessarily make sense for things that aren't matrices. There are still ways to generalize this. And so for all kind of intensive purposes, we can think about um, this conjugation action like happening. Like we have a group and it has this adjoint or conjugation action on its standard space. And the same for this sort of commutator action. And um, as I've kind of noted here before, these conjugation orbits that we looked, we looked at before, which were you took some skew remission matrix and you looked at, a, you know, all, you conjugated it by every unitary matrix and got all matrices with the same eigenvalues. You can now kind of, generalize this notion to the notion of an adjoint orbit, which is just going to be you take some element X of your tangent space and you act on it by the whole group. <coughs> okay. So we have, right, we have this unitary group with this tangent space. We, we generalize this notion to, to Lie groups in general with basically using kind of some, you know, some standard kind of manifold calculus. We end up getting roughly speaking um, a generalization of these of these adjoint maps, or sorry, of these conjugation and commutator maps, which are called the adjoints. And we have this generalization of Hermitian orbit, uh, which is called adjoint orbit. Okay, and, and so this last slide, which, which is just gonna be just to kind of close the loop here, um, we won't use, we'll use a little bit of what's on this slide, but not too much, right? We, we now have this tangent space uh, at the identity of this Lie group, and it has all sorts of structure on it. There are all sorts of operations. So we should just give it a name. And what it is called is a Lie algebra. And so the idea is a Lie algebra then is just some vector space that has this, what's called a Lie bracket on it that has some properties. But essentially this Lie bracket, all it, all it really is, is this commutator uh, that we saw earlier. 
So this is sort of an abstract way to define Lie algebras. Uh, we, we constructed a Lie algebra from you know, taking a group, looking at its tangent space, coming up with these operations. But there's also an abstract way to define it like this. Yeah. And so the, the, the point of me saying this slide, the reason I even bring this up, is mainly for this bilinearity property. I really just want this, the bilinearity of this, of this kind of algebra adjoint action or this commutator. It's pretty easy to see from the commutator that it's bilinear because the last thing we sort of need to generalize, right? We, we, have this, we have this tangent space, we have the actions on it, and now we need to generalize this inner product. And very similar with uh, the, the previous situation, the problem with generalizing this inner product is before we used this Frobenius inner product, which had this trace. Okay. And the problem is we don't, we don't have, we don't have trace here anymore, right? These are not matrices. We can't just take the trace. But the point is what we can do is we can think of this adjoint action, right? This is some linear operator. So if I fix Y in one in, uh, input of this commutator and I let this X input vary, this is some linear map, right? Some linear map on the on the Lie algebra. Oh, I guess I forgot to mention this. I really should. So we were using um, we were using this tangent space notation, and now that we're kind of like the the proper Lie algebra notation is this sort of um, I don't know how to, like kind of script G. And so these these are sort of now identified. And so this this map here, this uh, this linear adjoint map, is a map on on the Lie algebra. And because we have this, what we can do is we can now say, OK, well, we don't have trace of the elements of the Lie algebra itself. But what I can do is I can think of an element of the Lie algebra as this linear map. I can compose those linear maps. That's going to give me some other linear map on the Lie algebra G. And I can take trace of that. OK, and before we had this minus sign, but I just sort of moved it over here. Because the point is, this thing has a very special name, which Nishit talked about. It's called the killing form, named after this guy, uh, killing. <coughs> and, and the key fact that we're going to use here, and the, and the kind of the real reason why we, we restrict to compact groups a lot here, um, and why a lot of these results kind of only make sense for compact groups, is because this thing is negative definite whenever G is compact. Now, this is, there's a little caveat here. I'm kind of throwing some technical things away, but it doesn't really matter for us. So, um, I'm not really going to worry about it, but th this is kind of the point. Like, uh, whenever G is compact, you get this negative definite. And in fact, if you want it to be negative definite, you have to have a compact group that you started with. <laughs> okay. And, and further, as you might guess, this killing form has these same invariance properties we talked about before. <coughs> okay. So that was kind of a whirlwind um, going through this structure of the unitary group talking about how it generalized to Lie groups in general, how we came up with this Lie algebra. We have this inner product whenever our group is compact. We have these adjoint orbits. We have this sort of conjugation action. OK, so maybe now we have these tools that we need to get back to our two original problems. So that's what I'm going to do now. OK, so let's first talk about the optimization problem. So here is the problem. OK, we had this remission y. And we wanted to compute the minimum eigenvalue of y. And we wrote it in a number of ways, but these were two of them. One was we minimized over the unitary group and conjugated this, what Nasheeth called this capital E1 matrix. This is just the matrix with one in the top left, zeros everywhere else. Okay, you can minimize this inner product over unitaries, or you can just minimize this inner product over all rank one PSD projections. This is this, all the set of all P's here is exactly what you get. From this conjugation. Okay. And so what was used for this is this Scherhorn uh, theorem. And for us, what this said, and, and I, I think I said Nishith used this in a slightly different way, but I'm going to use it for P1 here. What this says is if you take this P1, the set of all rank one PSD projections, and you look at the set of all possible diagonal vectors that come from those matrices, you just get the standard simplex. Um, and this n here is the dimension of the simplex. So these are the set of all length n vectors with non-negative entries that sum to one. So this was a crucial feature that Nishith used, a uh, crucial theorem that Nishith used to prove this. OK, and in particular, if we make y diagonal, we can see exactly how this gets used, right? Because the point is what? Well, if y is diagonal, 
okay, then the off diagonal elements of P don't really matter to this inner product. So I can just restrict to the diagonal entries of P and restrict to, the di restrict to the diagonal entries of Y. And in fact, now I can write this minimization problem as just a minimization problem over the simplex. Now, these are the things, these are the diagonal entries of these P. Okay. And, the, and the, the whole thing here was that we had this Optimization problem over some, some adjoint orbit, which is some non-convex thing, and it ends up being equivalent to a linear optimization problem on a convex polytope. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take this problem, we're going to try to phrase it in this language we just looked at, okay? And we're going to do it for UN and then see if we can generalize from there. So the first thing is a comment I made earlier, right? So everything we had before was skew Hermitian matrices. That was the Lie algebra of the unitary group, okay? Um, and basically, it does, this is like kind of an inconsequential thing. This is equivalent to Hermitian matrices using this map right here. For every Hermitian matrix, you can multiply by I to get some skew Hermitian, and you can also go back in the same way. Um, and the point is like, you know, maybe, maybe there'll be some minus sign that comes out because now you're looking at an inner product of things with I next to it or something like this. But uh, up to that, the, there's, there's really no distinction here in terms of the optimization. Okay. And of course, as you might guess, the other thing is we have this Frobenius center product, right? Which is written down like this. And so instead of this, we can just replace it with this killing form, right? In fact, this is precisely the killing form for the Lie algebra of the unitary group, skewer emission matrices. And the last thing, which I also kind of hinted at before, I can rephrase this P1 as the unitary group applied to this matrix here just a set of all conjugates of E1, E1 transpose, and that's going to be an adjoint orbit of UN. So this conjugation action is the adjoint action of this group, and so this is one of these adjoint orbits. And this notion, as we saw, extends to other Lie groups. Okay, so we have all this set up. That's great. Okay, now we want to, can we generalize this to other compact Lie groups? Well, there are still a few things missing that we have not been able to generalize. So here's our optimization problem again. I've now just put this simplex uh, form on the right-hand side here, right? For some diagonal Y, we want to compute this minimum eigenvalue. Okay, and what is left? So this is what we have so far. If we have a compact Lie group G with its Lie algebra, you know, script G. Okay, on the UN side, we have these skew Hermitian matrices, a, a, a Hermitian or skew Hermitian Y. That's just an element of the Lie algebra. We have this P1, which is this conjugate of E1, E1 transpose. Well, that's just an adjoint orbit of G. And we have this inner product, which is just the negated killing form on G. But the things we are missing are still these two notions. The notion of a diagonal matrix, right? We started off with this diagonal Y so that we could do this. And also the notion of the standard simplex. How do these generalize? <clears throat> okay. And so the first thing we're going to see is how diagonal matrices generalize. And the point is, we're going to go back to this subgroup that I keep kind of mentioning for UN, this compact torus. And the point is, for this compact torus, is that it's some subgroup of the unitary group, but it also is corresponding to some subalgebra of uh, the unitary Lie algebra. This, this is not a big deal. Um, it just means that the bracket is sort of trivial on this, on this subalgebra, on this subspace, but it doesn't really matter. The point is that you have this kind of connection between diagonal matrices here and diagonal matrices here. So in, 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 in UN, at least in this, U, in this uh, Lie algebra UN, we have some way of maybe talking about diagonal matrices sort of without referring to the words diagonal, right? We have this abelian subalgebra. And in fact, if you just say a maximal abelian subalgebra, okay, which is gonna correspond to some maximal torus in the unitary group, this has a name, which is called a Carton subalgebra. Now this, Typically, Carton subalgebras are used for another context, um, and this is not how you would define them in that context. But in the compact case, this is sort of a, a fair definition. So I will stick with that. But the point is what we've done here is we found some way to talk about the diagonal matrices in the unitary Lie algebra without actually saying the words diagonal. And so now we can ask this question. Okay, so we have this, we have this diagonal, kind of these diagonal matrices. Okay, we can still think of them as diagonal matrices. Do they have some symmetries? And one thing we can say is, okay, well, let's suppose I want to con act uh, by conjugation from the unitary group on this 
subalgebra T. Well, if I want to preserve the set of all diagonal matrices, one thing I can act by certainly is a diagonal matrix. So if I conjugate something diagonal by something diagonal in here, I'll get another diagonal matrix. But the other thing that preserves this space um, are the permutation matrices. So if I conjugate a diagonal matrix by a permutation matrix, it just permutes the entries. And so the, the idea here then is this sort of thing happens kind of for any uh, maximal abelian subalgebra of a compact Lie, you know, Lie algebra like this. And we can give a, a name to this kind of discrete group that emerges, we can call it the vial group. And it's always gonna be some discrete thing. It's always gonna be finite and it can be defined for all Lie groups G. I unfortunately won't get to say much more about this. It's very important in the kind of classification of Lie groups um, and a number of other kind of structural results you wanna make. But for us, it's going to be this kind of discrete symmetry group that arises in this way. Okay, so, right, we figured out diagonal matrices, matrices. We have this standard simplex, or sorry, we have this vial group. Now can we, can we somehow get this standard simplex to come out? Okay, so this is where this constant convexity theorem comes up that Nasheeth was referring to. So what did we have before? Let's reiterate the Schur-Horn theorem. What it says is that you take some conjugation orbit of a Hermitian matrix H, you look at all the diagonal vectors, you get a convex polytope. That's the most general form of the theorem. For the cosine convexity theorem, what we do is we now are going to generalize all these things that appear in the Schur-Horn theorem to something that comes up in a Lie algebra. So we have diagonal matrices being this Carton subalgebra. We have the killing form being this minus trace. Um, we have this diag map here that's going to end up being, this is the generalization of that. It's just going to be the projection onto the Carton subalgebra. We have this finite vial group, and now we pick some element uh, X in the Carton subalgebra, which for us, we're, we're sort of restricting to diagonal Hermitian H here. And the theorem we end up getting is this. And let me parse this. Let me try to say what this says in the case of the unitary group. What this says is if you, you if G is the unitary group, it says, okay, I look at the unitary conjugation orbit of some diagonal permission matrix, and I intersect it with diagonal matrices. That is just going to be the permutations of the diagonal of the original matrix. Okay, so you, you look at this conjugation orbit, you get a bunch of permission matrices. The only diagonal ones are the ones where you permute the eigenvalues. And this is the one that's more important. This one says that, if I take this unitary orbit and I project it onto the diagonal, the thing I get is just the convex hole of this vial group orbit. And since the vial group is a finite group, I know that this orbit is something finite. So this is the convex hole of a finite number of points. And so this theorem exactly says that if you take some adjoint orbit and you project it onto this Carton subalgebra, which is essentially the same thing, you know, is sort of emulating diagonal matrices, you get some convex hole of a finite number of points, which is exactly a convex polytope. This is exactly what we want. So this is how the Schur-Horn theorem generalizes. And the way that, that, that this then allows us to do linear optimization is as follows. So we have this X, which is diagonal or is in this Carton subalgebra. We now have some Z, that's again, one of these diagonal slash Carton elements. And this is the problem we want to solve, right? This is just minimizing over the adjoint orbit, some, uh, some uh, linear function here. And so what do we do? Well, the first thing we can note is that since this is right in T, it makes no difference if I project this Y onto T, right? This is an orthogonal projection. And so this is not gonna affect the inner product. But now what I have is that I have that I'm minimizing over the orbit of pi of that element. This is the same thing as just minimizing over this. Okay, and I know that this is equal to this, so I can just replace the domain here. So now I'm minimizing over some convex polytope, this linear function. And then at the very end, right, I can actually remove this if I want, and now I'm minimizing over some discrete set. So I could stop here and just say that minimization over a convex polytope is equivalent to minimization over the orbit. Or I can also think of it as a discrete, you know, a minimization problem over a discrete set of points. Okay, and so the, the point of this is, right, we had this Schur-Horn theorem, 
it says something very nice. And it turns out that that very nice thing extends far beyond this rank one projections we started with and this minimum eigenvalue that we wanted to compute. Okay. So next I'm going to move on to the, um, to the uh, sampling part where we're trying to compute this partition function. Does anyone have any questions before I do that? I probably should have asked that earlier. So in the right hand side there, you just have a minimization over some discrete set of a linear function. I mean, what are the, are there other examples of uh, you know interesting file loops that are like combinatorial objects that you'd want to optimize over? I guess you get the uh, permutahedra there. Um, do you get anything else? So yeah, so permutahedron will come out here from just the normal. Oh, Vertices on the right side. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is just the, the the vertices of the. It'll, it'll end up being yeah the vertices yeah. of the of the polytope. So you definitely get the permutahedron. I mean, the other value groups that show up are things like this. Uh, I don't remember the name of it, but it's like um, the ortho uh, hypersymmetric group. It's like a, it's like a symmetric group with like a Z two kind of acting on it. It's two copies of the symmetric group that sort of interact. I've never really thought about what what one can get from optimizing uh, over whatever the convex hull of that would be. Um, yeah, I guess uh, that's a that's a, probably a fair question that I haven't really thought about. Um, but yeah, the definitely if you were just looking for the polytope, it's here, whereas this is just the vertices, like you were saying. Yeah, I was wondering, like, would you sometimes get things that are clearly in too hard to optimize over, like, uh, infinite sets? Or, uh, yeah, I, know. I mean, I, I would. I would doubt it because I would expect kind of maybe this method to, hmm. I don't know, actually. The sign permutation basis is an interesting um, So you add just the same permutation matrices, but you can take all signs. It's another group, it's a slightly louder. Not that I see an application. By the way, do you know what is the algebra for which it's what's the algebra for which this is the one variable? For which the uh, sign permutations? Yeah. Um, I think it. I want to say it's the symplectic group, but I but I actually don't know. Actually, now that now that you asked this. Um, I don't, I can't, I can't remember the difference actually between the orthogonal for one of them. For, it's like the orthogonal group has the sign permutations or, or the symplectic group does. And then the other one has something slightly different. And I can't quite remember what they are. I don't, I don't remember. Yeah, I also have a question about, um, so with this like abstract of um, is it, does it make it easier to like uh, come up with some algorithm like, for this? Because like, for example, for the minimum eigenvalue, like for the very special case, we know like there's like a uh, efficient algorithm. So I was just wondering, like with this like formalism, uh, with like the algebra, you can like call with the algorithm for this problem. So there are definitely algorithms for certain optimization problems on uh, uh, if you kind of go to this more general Lie algebra framework. The ones I'm familiar with are actually not. This is sort of more of a toy problem, just to kind of without. Well, kind of to show you what like something very basic that could be done. Um, but there are certain the, the ones that I'm more familiar with are like uh, you can ask to do some kind of relative entropy programming over adjoint orbits of of Lie groups. Um, and Nishith and I have some work about that. So that's like some optimization problem over some some adjoint orbit um, that you can you can you, you it relies on this cosine convexity theorem for certain for certain aspects of it. You have to at some point go. Go to you know show that the uh, you basically have to show at some point that the op the optimum occurs like at an extreme point like this, but you don't. It doesn't really. This doesn't really give you an algorithm. It just sort of shows you that like you know you expect to get some kind of extreme point. You hope that to be the case, and then this theorem says that it doesn't really aid with the algorithm. Though. Um, but in terms of algorithms coming from this, I'm not. I'm not sure. Sorry, another maybe like a dumb question and related to this one. Is it okay. clear that so I guess the, the very that was the, the very uh, the optimization problem that Nishith looked at. And now let's look at the, the sampling problem. 
Okay. This one, you know, as you might as you might guess, this one is going to be a little bit less clear, maybe as to how exactly the results come from kind of these these added structures, right? With this other one, okay, maybe you could sort of squint and see, okay, there's there's some kind of polytope here. When I look at some some an analogy to diagonal matrices, and then we can do linear optimization. Okay, uh, this one is going to be a little bit harder, as because I mean, as you might guess, the the you know, from the result that we saw in Nishi's talk, it's a lot more kind of magical what, what happens. Uh, and unfortunately, I won't be able to say too much. And most of the proofs I know of these results are pretty, uh, pretty long-winded. Um, so I won't be able to go into to it too much, but I'll try to give you a sense. Okay, so here's the, here's the sampling problem um, that we looked at before. We had some Hermitian matrix Y, and we wanted to sample from this density that's very similar to, you know, the thing we were optimizing. So we have this density function on the complex unit sphere. Or we have this density function on the set of rank one projections, this adjoint orbit. Okay, and the the formula that, that Nishith showed us was the following, right? So if I have some Hermitian y with distinct eigenvalues, then I have I can look at this integral over the rank one projections. It turns out to be some integral over the standard simplex in Rn, and then that actually has some really nice, very small sum formula. Okay, so Nishith showed us this. And the point is that, right, we get some exact formula for the partition function. And this basically, you know, like morally should enable sampling. This is actually not always true in, in all the cases we have here. But sort of the idea is if you can get some partition function, you think that you should be able to sample. So the first thing we're going to try to do here is, is see if we can generalize this partition function formula. And so we're going to ask the same question. Can we phrase this in Lee theoretic language? And the first few things are exactly the things we saw before, right? We have this, this P1. This is just some adjoint orbit of UN. Or if you think about, right, we're going to still do this thing where Hermitian and SU Hermitian are basically identified. We have this, uh, <clears throat> this inner product, uh, which is just the trace here um, with, a, with a minus sign. And this is this killing form for the skew Hermitian matrices. And so that's exactly what's going to play the role of this and what's going to be this adjoint orbit here. OK, but what is left over for us is this, uh, this measure, mu1, here that we haven't really talked about. We've even talked about this simplex a little bit, right? We know maybe how you might expect matrices to become vectors and there'd be a simplex showing up. We don't maybe exactly know how that's going to work. But we, we sort of have some idea of that. The thing that we're missing is just this measure. So let's talk about where this measure comes from. So in the sheath's talk, this measure mu1 um, is, some, is some measure on this adjoint orbit on the set of rank one projections that was invariant under the conjugation action of un. And all that means is if I take some integral over some function and I conjugate the function by u, it's just equal to if I were to take the integral over the function without the conjugation. So these are equal for all integrable functions. And the point here is that if you take a compact Lie group, that it has some very special conjugation invariant measure called the Haar measure. And I will tell you the, the way to construct this for the unitary group. It's, it's not so hard, right? You, the unitary group, you want to have some, some measure on the unitary group that's invariant under conjugation by unitaries. And so, well, what are, what's like kind of the most natural thing you can think of? The unitary group, you can think of it as matrices whose, whose columns are, are orthonormal bases of some complex vector space. And so one way to come up with, uh, one way to sample really naturally from the unitary group is to just say, okay, I'm going to pick some random vectors and see the n. I'm going to use Gram-Schmidt orthonormalization. I'm going to then take all those vectors and put them as columns in some matrix. And it turns out this, this you know, sampling from that, right, that's going to give me some unitary matrix. And that process actually samples from this hard measure. Okay, so this hard measure, at least in the unitary group, is very natural. And um, it's, it's, I don't know similar constructions for the other groups, um, but it's this, this theorem of Haar has been known for, for quite some time. So you have this very natural uh, invariant measure on the group. And what, you can, what the point is, is that this, this invariant measure then sort of uh, induces an invariant measure on every adjoint orbit. And this is, a, this is also a very straightforward fact. Um, it's just using the fact that, um, yeah, I won't even say anything about it. Uh, but the point is, it, it induces some measure, hard measure on on the on the orbits like this. So now I have right. If I take some some integral over the orbit and I act on the input to this function by 
some group element. It's the same as if I didn't. And in fact, this measure mu1 is exactly um, what you get whenever you do this process with unitary group and with this adjoint orbit p1. So now we have this way to generalize at least this expression that we care about over here, which is basically as follows. So before I had this expression, this is what I wanted to write down a formula for. And so now I can replace this by some adjoint orbit. I can replace this by this killing form. And then I can replace this measure by this Har measure that I get from the group. So now how, what formulas can I get now from this? Okay, so this, this next page is gonna, is gonna talk about these formulas. Um, the, the kind of slide after, hopefully I'll give you a little motivation for why you'd expect at least one of them to work out. Um, so here was our original formula that the sheath talked about. And so now here is this really general Harish Chandra formula that, that he said that he hoped that I would, that I would write down. It's pretty difficult to write down um, because of, there's a, kind of a lot of things that I, I don't want to say. Um, but basically, this is sort of the expression here. You have some compact Lie group, same caveats as before. Um, you have some, it's associated Lie algebra. You have your Carton subalgebra. So this was your notion of diagonal matrix. You have your Weyl group and you have some diagonal elements. And then from there, you can write this integral that we care about, right? This is, this is a version of this we can write it as this finite sum formula like this. So it's some constant, which is sort of like factorials, and there's some Vandermond determinant uh, of the, uh, uh, related to the, the, these, these elements here. And then you have this sum over the Weyl group. And this, you know, again, unfortunately, there's just a lot of notation here uh, that, that I won't really be able to go into, but the way you want to think about this is you have some sum over this finite Weyl group. The Weyl group can be very large. Right, we know that Sn has n factorial elements. You have some sine term of the element of the Weyl group that you're that you're summing over, and then you have something very similar to what showed up in the integral here. Except instead of um, instead of having some z coming from the adjoint orbit, you're acting on your your x by this element of the Weyl group. And the point is, if you think of W as being Sn, so if you think of the unitary group case, okay, so let me, just, let me just write this down. If you think of the unitary group case, well, what's happening here? You're having a sum over the symmetric group. This is some kind of sign, right? This is going to be like the sum, minus one of the sign of permutation. And you have some exponential here, which you can write as some product. <coughs> and the point is, if you kind of put this all together, this is basically just an expression for the determinant. So that's how you get this HCIZ formula that he wrote down, at least when restricted to uh, this adjoint orbit. He wrote a slightly different form of it, but these forms are equivalent. You basically get this determinant up here, you get some Vandermonds down here, and you get some factorials here. And the point of this, as Nasheath pointed out, is that this gives you some finite sum formula for any adjoint orbit of any compact Lie group. And the point is, from, for matrix groups, for most of the groups that we had in that big list, um, it pretty much always boils down to a sum of, of like, I think, two or less determinants. Maybe, maybe there's three one time. I can't remember. It's not very obvious from this how you should be able to get determinants, but it's, it's sort of you go and do the casework for kind of the cases that you, know, that you might care about, like, say, symplectic or, or orthogonal group, you can get some kind of determinant formula here. Okay, and so there, there's kind of two remaining questions with this, uh, with this. The first one is, okay, now we have some partition function formula for these adjoint orbits, okay? It, it, looks like some, it looks like some determinant. In most of the nice cases, it looks like some determinant. So there's two outstanding things. The first thing is how, what about this thing here, this simplex formula? We did, we sort of skipped that, right? We went straight from this to this. And the second thing, which is very related to this fact that we don't have a simplex formula yet, is this kind of thing I said a few slides ago where I said, like, basically, we have a partition function that should imply that we can sample, right? Why doesn't having this partition function imply that, that we can sample? Um, and so I'm going to talk about both of those things at the same time, and we're going to see exactly how this, uh, how this comes about in a more general case. So the first thing I'll say is I'm only going to be able to talk about this kind of picture for UN. 
because I don't really know the picture very well for other compact groups. So this is like one of the open problems of this, of this talk. Um, and I'll list that kind of at the end slide. But let's let's just take a look at this expression again, right? We we sort of showed the generalization of these outer two. How do we get this middle thing? Okay, so here here's like the cheapest thing you can do, right? We know that this simplex is the thing that comes out of applying the cosine convexity theorem or the Shore-Horn theorem to this P1, right? That's what we saw in the previous slides. So why don't we just apply this cosine convexity theorem to some general unitary orbit, right? Whatever orbit I decide to put here. I'm going to get some, you know, projection that's going to be some convex hole, and I'm going to get some, you know, permutahedron or some kind of polytope here. Maybe I can just integrate over that, and everything will be great. So that would be the, the idea. That would be the hope. Um, but unfortunately, that is is not true. And basically, to make this equal, you need to add. And Nishith pointed made, made a comment about this. You need to add a, a piecewise polynomial function here that that I have not been able to understand, and I don't really know anyone who, who could, I don't know. I mean, if, if someone knows how to compute it, I would, I would, love, to, I would love to hear that algorithm, um, but I don't know what it is, and we couldn't figure it out. Um, and so because of that, this is, you know, we sort of had to try something different, okay? And this is this Rayleigh map that, uh, that Nishis was talking about. So here's the thing that we tried that was different. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about this map script R, okay? And the point is you're going to you're going to plug in some here's just going to be some Hermitian matrix and it's going to output um, a big kind of triangle of, of numbers and here's how it goes. So for whatever J is, I'm going to look at the leading principle J by J sub matrix and I'm just going to list the eigenvalues um, of that sub matrix. So when J equals three, I'm going to list the eigenvalues of the whole matrix. When j equals two, I'm going to list the eigenvalues of, of this top two by two matrix. And when j equals one, there's just going to be one value, which is this upper diagonal entry. And so this is going to form some triangle. I'm going to have three elements at the top, two below it, and then one below that. And the reason why this is referred to as the Rayleigh map is because of this kind of Rayleigh interlacing or Rayleigh Cauchy interlacing theorem which basically just says, what, the, what this says is that if I take the eigenvalues of some matrix here, there's three of them, and I look at the eigenvalues of just a, a submatrix that has one less, a principal submatrix with one less row and column, then the eigenvalues uh, of this smaller matrix are interlaced between the eigenvalues of the larger matrix. So, you know, the first, the first eigenvalue is somewhere in between the first and second eigenvalue of the bigger matrix. The second eigenvalue is somewhere in between the second and third eigenvalue of the bigger matrix. So we get all these inequalities, and you can sort of inductively get all of these inequalities on all these successive submatrices of um, this, this matrix Z you started with, or I guess X. And the point is, these inequalities, right? I mean, these are just a set of inequalities. They cut out some polytope. It's called the gelfand settlin polytope. But the, but the great fact is not only that, but now if you take your entire unitary orbit and you apply this Rayleigh map to it, you actually get the whole polytope. All right, so this is somehow very similar to the Schurhorn theorem, except now we have this kind of way more complicated Rayleigh map. And the point is then that also further beyond that, we have that if we, if we take this measure that we started off with, this measure um, on the adjoint orbit here, and we push it forward through this R, we now actually get Lebesgue measure. So this sort of is better emulating this picture here, right? We started with this. We wanted to kind of push this exponential density forward. We get some exponential things times Lebesgue, and that picture persists whenever you choose this Rayleigh map like this. And so this is one way that you can prove this HCIZ partition function formula. But another nice thing about this is this means that sampling from um, these, these adjoint orbits, these unitary orbits, are, uh, are sort of equivalent to sampling from this gelfand settlin polytope according to this exponential density. That's going to look something like this. It's going to be a little bit different, but we can, it's, it's sort of, we can sample from the polytope according to this density, and then we can somehow transfer that sample back to the adjoint orbit. Okay, and this is exactly this, the only sampling algorithm I know to try to actually use this part, the partition function formula we have here to actually sample from these adjoint orbits. Just because we have this partition function formula, I don't actually know how to just use that to sample, but this fact that it's connected to some polytope, that's the thing that I know how to use 
to, to be able to actually sample. Sample from the polytope, bring it back to the orbit. Okay. What do you mean by bringing it back? Yeah, so... Uh, it's a sample, right? Well, no, it's going to be, right? It's, uh, I mean, I'll sample from the, from the set of all triangles. So this GT polytope is the set of all, like, collections of, of, of successive interlacing eigenvalues. That's some polytope that has some really nice measure on it. I can sample from that using some polytope sampling algorithm. And coming back, I, which I, I, we can maybe, yeah, I, we can talk about it after I'm, I, I should probably go ahead and finish the talk here. But we, if you have, if you wanted me to talk about that, I can. There, there's sort of a way to kind of inductively construct a unitary, uh, sorry, uh, Inductively, inductively construct some element of this adjoint orbit by sort of using kind of each row of this triangle. You sort of, you sort of, like, you know, I mean, like, I guess the cheapest thing to say is you, like the, the row that's length one is going to completely determine this, this, this upper left entry here. And now you have some pair of eigenvalues for this matrix. And there's some way to construct some, some two by two matrix from that. And you kind of keep doing this. And the point is, Somehow at, at every step, there's like a, a, like a compact torus action acting on these new off diagonal entries. And that's sort of the degree of freedom you have. In fact, there's a way to think of this Rayleigh map as a, as a type of moment map, just with a bunch of different compact torus actions kind of at different stages of the construction of this triangle. Um, that's also something I don't, I, I, I don't know that sort of rigorously. I just know that there's, you can do something like that. Um, and I think you can interpret it kind of in the in the usual way as some kind of more complicated moment map. But but anyway, that's how you would you would take some triangle and, and you would try to bring it back. Um, okay, so yeah, I'm, I think I'm over time here. So let me just throw up the last slide, which just kind of says some of the things that have been said over the over the course of this here. So we saw uh, we saw these two problems that she's talked about. Um, in this talk, we kind of saw how these the symmetries that were showing up in these problems come from Lie theory, um, and the point is that these symmetries allow for you know the powerful use of the use of powerful tools, in particular transferring non-convex problems to convex polytopes. And then the open questions are the things I kind of I kind of mentioned, right? So we have these for for instance, okay, you know we talked about a lot of things for adjoint number to UN, but what about other compact Lie groups? We have this HC formula, but I don't know how to sample for things beyond the unitary group. Especially this would be interesting, um, right? Even even doing these sampling from the from the real unit sphere, there might be some. Well, I guess for the unit sphere, maybe there's some algorithms, but like more general orbits, it's it's unclear. And then also more general orbits, even beyond adjoint orbits. So these these adjoint orbits of compact groups are actually symplectic, and so maybe you can sort of generalize these to other symplectic orbits, or maybe Riemannian orbits. I'm not I'm not really sure. I haven't haven't thought about that too much. So um, anyway, thanks a lot. Uh, and as 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 I pointed out at the beginning, here are the notes for the sheet and my talk. Questions? I guess I didn't quite uh, reach clarity on the sampling from the sampling photo, but we can take it offline. Okay. Uh, I just want to mention one thing: there is work in pure matrix theory, so to speak, that allows you, given a, given a point in that polytope allows you to construct a big matrix so that its nested sequence of sub principal sub matrices has the correct uh, yeah. spectra. Yeah. So this probably is related to how you do something. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I mean, like whenever we, so uh, my most recent paper with Nishith and, and Colin McSwiggin, we, we do, we kind of demonstrate this sampling algorithm. And, you know, it was one of these things where when we were working on it, we just tried to come up with something that would work. And I think by the time we figured out what would work to come back, we found some other papers that kind of do this. So I, that is not surprising. In fact, maybe we, we might even miss a reference, honestly. If you, if you have the explicit reference where that's like really written down, I would, I would, I would love to see it. Yeah, I mean, I just mean that would probably make your life easier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The result I, that's there and then just interpret it in the context of your problem. Yeah. And like I say, I'm, I'm sure someone, it's not a very complicated thing to, to go back. Like once you kind of see it, it's, it's very clear what you, what you need right. to do. Right. Um, so it's not surprising to me that maybe someone had, had come up with that already. You also need, uh, you need to go back to a uniformly random image. So maybe it's not totally. Oh yeah. Oh, actually that's, that's, that is a good question. Is it, is it just a way to construct a matrix? 
I do not recall okay. the details, okay. but uh, yeah, it's worth looking at. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, makes it, it accomplishes basically what you need, or you want to tweak it just a little bit. Yeah, and and also, I mean, like these these the sampling algorithms for uh, for these other groups coming back is also a little unclear what to do. So it'd be maybe if they do it for like real symmetric matrices or something that would also be pretty interesting. So you did mention the compact uh, example of SLM. What about SLM? Can you do it or not do it? Do you know uh, what's the analog of? Uh, uh, for for what, I'm sorry. S S -L -M. S -L -M. Non compact. For, for non compact groups. Is that what you're? Special linear group. Special linear group. Group. You get a compact linear algebra, no? No. No, you don't get it. Yeah, no, you don't. You get a you get a semi simple one. You get a, a like a non degenerate killing form, but it won't be it won't be indefinite either way. I have a couple of questions. One was, uh, could you go back to the like formula, the HCIZ and the the like some of. Probably, I mean, one thing I'm confused is the left hand side is like a positive uh, sum of exponential things and the right hand side has signs so yeah. how is that even possible i mean yeah so i mean i mean it's i mean the same thing kind of goes for uh for this right yeah i mean the, the point is i think that like essentially this is something like you know the key fact here is that a vandermond determinant i believe is, is positive right i mean has a, has a particular sign and and that's kind of you know, you're gonna have some cancellation there i mean you really i guess you really won't because you're just it's a bunch of products of things that will be that will be positive, both positive or negative. And this minus sign, you know, it, it sort of it cancels out with some minus sign that will come from this determinant. But the but the point is somehow there is some cancellation like this, even though you have kind of this determinant like formula with a bunch of signs, you end up sort of always getting a positive number. Um, and I don't I don't exactly know again beyond like Vandermon determinant as like something I can say into the air. I don't exactly know why. Like why you would why this sort of happens, um, but but it does. I mean, this is this is what happens. Um, I mean, but the sign up there uh, that can actually be negative sometimes. Yeah, like like if you expanded the determinant, yeah. right? I mean, these are all positive numbers. This is a yes, yes. positive uh, entry matrix. The determinant's going to have a bunch of signs like exactly like this. But some, but, but again, for some reason, I mean. No, we're Values positive. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. This will always be positive. This will have some. There'll be some cancellation. It's just. Yeah. It will always be positive. It's, it's just interesting. I mean, the left hand side is also like log convex, I guess. Yeah. Too, and the right hand side is not obviously at all. Yeah. But but I guess once you form this determinant, then it, then it becomes clear. Um, and the, and again, for most of the matrix groups that that like you know the, the classic compact matrix groups, this will become some determinants and it becomes pretty clear. That it's also going to be welcome to this. but yeah. But from this formula, I, I don't I don't know why. I don't know if there's some. In fact, I don't know of any way of working with this beyond converting it into some determinate expressions and then kind of moving on. All right. Let's uh, thank Charles again.